Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to start by uh, thanking the organizing committee for uh, having me here, at least uh, virtually, uh, especially uh, Jacob uh, Lesnivsky, who has been fairly enthusiastic about this, uh, even uh, uh, in the midst of you know these uh, health issues that have prevented me from from traveling to Chicago. Uh, my regret is, of course, that I won't be able to to uh, take any questions and answers directly. Uh, feel free to send me an email, and I'll try to respond as soon as possible. But, I mean, this will not be part of, of the debate that you're having today at the workshop, uh, for which, of course, I send you my best wishes. Um, so, just uh, so as not to be mysterious or anything, I will start by giving up my main argument from the outset. Uh, it goes more or less as follows. Uh, I'm arguing that uh, neoliberal globalization uh, ruined uh, Mexico's peasant economy, and this in turn led to the loss of Mexico's food sufficiency, which in turn ended up resulting in the loss of labor sovereignty. And by labor sovereignty, what I mean is uh, a nation's ability to uh, provide gainful employment for a vast majority of the population. Uh, so when a nation loses its uh, labor sovereignty, what happens is people start migrating. And that's exactly what's uh, been happening in Mexico uh, over the past uh, uh, decade, decade and a half. Uh, Mexico's out-migrants have increased uh, quite dramatically uh, just in the first uh, five years of uh, the present century, uh, Mexico's uh, loss of people uh, were greater than the losses by China, which is you know more than 10 times bigger, and also than the losses of, of India. Again, about 10 times bigger than, than Mexico. So uh, here's how uh, I'm going to try to make this point. I will first uh, give some background on the neoliberal globalization in NAFTA, uh, then a very brief uh, scheme of uh, neoliberalism's downsides, uh, followed by the food division of labor, which is at the core of the argument that uh, you know, losing food self-sufficiency has led to the loss of labor sovereignty. And then I will outline, merely outline, some uh, migration debates, and I trust that some of my colleagues presenting today will go more into depth about this, uh, and finally end up with some conclusions. But the main point is uh, to um, uh, formulate you know, some of the, of the main political economic parameters for migration and the challenges that, that these raises. So, um, uh, NAFTA came at a time when um, uh, neo the neoliberal economic project was in full swing. Uh, and these resulted from the exhaustion of the Fordist model of capitalist accumulation, uh, which has been associated with uh, the epoch of capitalism that started in the late 1930s with uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt uh, and went all the way to the late 1960s. It was a period of... Uh, considerable economic growth, uh, the emergence of the welfare state. Uh, there was a, what has been called a, a virtuous circle, not a vicious, but a virtuous circle between mass consumption on the one hand and mass production on the other hand. Uh, so, you know, uh, a lot of uh, increased productivity, uh, which was corresponded by increased uh, uh, purchasing power from the masses of the population, including the working class. I guess uh, some of the excluded groups uh, in this were mostly women and minorities, in the United States at, at least. Uh, now, by the end of the 1960s and the beginning of the 70s, uh, Fordism, or the Fordist uh, model of accumulation, hit a crisis uh, expressed in uh, too much production that was not being absorbed by uh, existing demand, uh, this generated a profitability crisis, uh, 
And this was also associated by uh, the emerging competition from other countries like uh, Japan and Germany. Uh, it became expressed in, in growing uh, trade deficits for the United States. Um, so one of my arguments is, uh, well, the, the competing uh, capitalist models uh, during the 1990s uh, were, you know, state-led type of capitalism, primarily in Japan and uh, the Asian t tigers, uh, more of a social economy model in uh, Germany and Northern Europe, and then, of course, uh, neoliberalism, uh, which uh, started with Margaret Thatcher in the UK, with uh, Ronald Reagan in the United States, Brian Mulroney in, in Canada, um, and several other countries, uh, as pointed out uh, in your slide there. So uh, I will try to describe, uh, you know, what are the main uh, aspects of uh, the ne neoliberal uh, model and how it's related to NAFTA. So my argument is that uh, at the core of the neoliberal uh, economic model has been trying to cut labor costs. And uh, in order to do this, there have been a series of measures taken across the board uh, in the countries that have uh, adopted this uh, type of uh, economic refor reform. Uh, liberalize uh, commodity and investment flows. Uh, remember that uh, uh, one of the key features of uh, Fordism was uh, that uh, ac accumulation patterns at that time were primarily focused on the nation state. And so, uh, something that's actually uh, not said in this uh, slide here is that um, uh, the focus of accumulation shifted from the nation state to the world economy. And so that's why we're talking about neoliberal globalization, because that was the whole point. You know, liberalize uh, things, particularly commodity and investment uh, markets, uh, so that capital could regain its uh, profitability. Uh, an associated uh, feature, though, is that uh, uh, there was no consistency with regard to the owners of labor power, uh, workers. They had to stay in their national boundaries, all right? So owners of commodities can seek the highest prices. Owners of capital can also seek the highest uh, uh, profit rates, but workers can't. You know, they have to stay put in their national boundaries. So in the end, this was all geared to globalized production and trade. Uh, so what have been some of neoliberalism's downsides? Uh, and I'm going to be very schematic about this, uh, outsourcing the process by which uh, a lot of the manufacturing industry that was located in the United States, particularly in the northern states, uh, was shifted to the less unionized uh, uh, southern states and eventually mostly to uh, cheap wage countries. These entailed uh, what could be labeled uh, as an economic disarticulation. Uh, disarticulation particularly between you know, production and consumption, which is what uh, had created that virtuous circle in, in Fordism. Uh, and eventually this also uh, generates a separation of uh, production and reproduction sites. In the case of the migrants, which is our main topic uh, in, in this uh, workshop, uh, in the case of Mexican migrants, uh, the reproduction of their families takes place primarily in Mexico, but they are generating their wage incomes in the United States or in Canada. So, uh, in uh, with the recent uh, recovery of the U.S. crisis, which uh, has created uh, tremendous tragedies in the form of, uh, well, home losses, which uh, happens to be, I mean, the home happens to be, you know, one of the key uh, indicators of having reached the American dream. And a lot of people have lost their houses. Now, uh, there are some signs, some data that uh, uh, manufacturing seems to be growing once again in some sections of the Rust Belt, but uh, I have this quote from the latest issue of The Economist, actually, which says, as long as emerging markets are growing fastest, that's where the bulk of new manufacturing jobs are likely to go. So I think it might be illusory to think uh, that uh, you know, there's going to be a re uh, 
birth of manufacturing, uh, at least uh, to the levels that uh, were present uh, up until the 1980s in the United States. So, uh, what kind of social dislocations uh, have resulted from neoliberalism? And uh, again, I'm going to be fairly schematic about this. Uh, the new division of labor, food vulnerability, two points on which I will focus on uh, in, in the next uh, parts of my lecture, uh, and uh, migration, and in the case of Mexico and the United States, uh, tremendous violence. So, uh, zooming into the food division of labor, uh, what I'm going to do is um, uh, start by pointing out some of uh, the paradoxes of Mexican agriculture. Uh, it so happened that uh, Mexico had been self-sufficient in, in food production, in agriculture. It, it was even able to export uh, some uh, commodities. Uh, but it, it was self-sufficient until 1989, uh, more or less. Uh, after that time, I mean, that was the time when uh, former President uh, Salinas decided that he really wanted Mexico's economy to become integrated into the North American economy. So even before NAFTA, which started in 1994, uh, President Salinas unilaterally opened the Mexican economy as of, you know, the late uh, 1980s. Uh, so corn imports uh, started to spike after 1989. Uh, grains and cereals uh, imports grew tremendously from the United States. Uh, fruits and vegetables also began to be exported uh, from Mexico to the United States, uh, except that uh, increased uh, production of fruits and vegetables did not generate nearly the jobs that were being lost in grains production in Mexico, which were being produced primarily by uh, smallholder peasants. So that's where the key to the ruin of the peasant economy lies, in this uh, growing importation of uh, U.S. grains, which are, by the way, heavily subsidized. And, uh, you know, Mexican peasants were not able to compete with uh, U.S. farmers and Canadian farmers. Uh, so Mexico's per capita food production actually has grown, uh, except that, you know, a lot of that food is not consumed in Mexico it's consumed increasingly in North America. There has been uh, a growth of obesity mixed with uh, food insecurity and out-migration as a survival strategy. So, uh, this is just a list of uh, the countries with the greatest obesity rates measured by the bo uh, body mass index. So, it takes into account, uh, you know, people's weight. Uh, and it, I don't know if this is just a coincidence or a spurious uh, correlation. Uh, but it so happens that the countries that endorsed neoliberalism most whor uh, wholeheartedly are the ones that also have the greatest obesity rates. And, I, I mean, this is obviously a subject for further research, but my hypothesis there would be that uh, neoliberalism has caused decreasing quality in food, and that in turn generates obesity. And in the case of Mexico, diabetes happens to be the main cause of death. And there are about 10 million, about 10% you know, of the population uh, suffer from diabetes. Now, uh, in the past uh, several years, since uh, the end of 2006, particularly since 2007, there has been a food price uh, inflation crisis. Uh, it diminished a bit uh, through 2009, but it, uh, you know, food prices have spiked again in, uh, uh, in 2010, and they're continuing to do so uh, in 2011, particularly associated with also uh, increasing uh, petrol prices or oil prices. Now, uh, it should be uh, evident that uh, households, poorer households, uh, with, uh, you know, that dedicate a large percentage of their budget to food are going to suffer disproportionately from a food price crisis. Well, on average terms, at least, uh, what we have here is uh, the household budget share of food in the three NAFTA countries. Uh, the United States is the one that devotes the lowest uh, share of uh, food, uh, of, of the budget to food, 
And in Mexico's uh, share is actually growing. I mean, we have data there only until 2005, but um, I would expect that, uh, you know, with the crisis of the last uh, few years, those percentages of uh, household budgets, perhaps in the three countries, uh, have gone up, except that uh, it is documented that price increases in the United States are not much more than 4% compared with uh, way higher uh, price inflation indexes of, for food in, in the case of Mexico. Canada is also fairly self-sufficient in food production, even though it imports a lot of uh, uh, what you might call uh, luxury foods. So I'll give you some figures about that in a minute. Uh, just to start, uh, what we have here is um, average averages for total food supply on a kilocalorie per capita per day from 1985 to 2007. Again, the three countries. Uh, what I find most striking in these figures is the fact that in the early period, you know, well before uh, Mexico's uh, opening to the global economy, on a per capita basis, Mexicans actually had a greater amount of food supply than Canadians. All right, the yellow line there is for the United States, uh, red is for Canada, green is for Mexico. So uh, I find that uh, particularly interesting. And so what we find uh, for the two North American countries, Canada and the United States, is that there is a process of convergence you know, from Canada to the United States uh, patterns of uh, food consumption per capita. Uh, whereas Mexico has increased a bit, but it stayed mostly flat. And uh, if we break down you know, some of this composition of uh, you know, total food uh, consumption, uh, the irony is that um, now that Mexico is exporting a lot of vegetables to North America, Mexicans' consumption of vegetables has stayed mostly flat, as that uh, green line uh, shows. Whereas, again, you know, Canada's uh, per capita uh, consumption of vegetables has increased very close to the levels of the United States. So... Can we talk about a food trade dependency? And my answer is definitely yes for the case of Mexico, no for Canada and the United States. But let me break it down a bit. Uh, so NAFTA did result in a substantial food trade growth, you know, among the, the three countries. Uh, the US and Canada has increased its food imports uh, considerably but remain mostly food self-sufficient. And I mean, I have data to show, and I've published this in, in an article in Rural Sociology, that um, uh, the top six imports from Canada and the United States include what you might designate as primarily luxury foods. It actually includes, in the case of Canada, pet foods, all right? So it's not like people are going to starve if, uh, you know, there's a little bit of uh, crunch on, on the importation of food. Uh, Canada and the U.S. Uh, food trade surplus, however, more than offsets or, or more than makes up for, for food imports. In other words, uh, you know, both uh, Canada and the United States are exporting very hefty amounts of their agricultural production, whereas Mexico continues to have a, a, a growing food trade deficit, uh, despite of also growing fruit and vegetables uh, exports. So um, how can we relate this to, to the migration debates? Well, uh, let's start with uh, you know, pointing out, uh, I guess, what these uh, cartoons tries to make obvious, that uh, the United States is a nation that is very much split right down the middle when it comes to migration debates. Uh, you know, there are some people who don't want to have anything to do with migrants, others that welcome them, and others that are very concerned with uh, their human and labor rights. So uh, from my exploration of uh, the literature on the migration debates, it seems to me like the guiding, the main guiding question for this debate is uh, more or less as follows. Does migration benefit 
the destination countries, and if so, in what spheres and under what conditions. And uh, I mean, these, these debates uh, are reproduced in, in uh, receiving countries, uh, whether it's the United States or Scandinavian countries or Germany. Uh, but in the United States, for the most part, this is the way I characterize uh, the literature. I would say that, uh, you know, the first uh, uh, strand, what I call nativists or xenophobes, basically would prefer not to deal with migrants at all. You know, let's keep it all to Americans and let's uh, build uh, fences or whatever it takes to keep migrants away. But then there's the liberals. Uh, maybe we can add the neoliberal uh, uh, folks who want to um, have as many migrants as possible because that results in lowering wages. So, hey, you know, as long as uh, profitability can increase, I'm good with that. And I'm, you know, kind of uh, simplifying the arguments here. Uh, and, but then there are uh, people with uh, social democratic inclinations that uh, are very concerned about uh, the impact uh, both on migrants uh, in terms of their working conditions, uh, particularly if they are undocumented or, or, or unauthorized uh, to work in the United States. Uh, and they're also concerned with what kind of impact uh, immigrants might have on the wages of the local labor force. So uh, some of their arguments uh, are around uh, having equal rights for everybody working in the nation. So um, uh, I'm now going to turn to, uh, I guess, a fourth position, uh, which I have labeled uh, critics from sending countries. And this should not be taken uh, literally in the sense that uh, uh, these critics are let's say, from the standpoint of sending countries. Uh, many of the critics are from sending countries, uh, like some of my colleagues in, in Zacatecas, uh, Raul Delgado Weiss. Uh, but uh, the, the main concern here is not so much how do migrants benefit receiving nations, but what are the consequences for sending nations? You know, what's happening to countries that lose their labor sovereignty and begin to lose their people? Well, you know, some of their arguments uh, that have been documented uh, are more or less as follows, that uh, sending countries become dormitories because of this uh, uh, problem of the separation that I pointed out earlier, the separation between production and reproduction sites. So, you know, the workers are in receiving countries, but their families remain in in the sending countries. Uh, that puts the sending countries in a low development trap, uh, partly because the best workers are the ones that leave. Uh, and then migration subtracts uh, the basis for a sustainable development. Uh, and then on the side of the receiving countries, uh, there are new immovable castes that are formed in those countries. Uh, which generates uh, what some critics have labeled as a new type of feudalism or a new serfdom. Uh, I've uh, seen this in the case of, of Canada. Uh, that's what I've been studying the past uh, couple of years, so the case of uh, migrant workers on the seasonal, under the Seasonal Agricultural Workers Program. Even though they come here legally, uh, they're still assigned to a single employer, right? And if they want to come back the following year, well, they better get a good review from their employer or else they won't come back. So that puts them in a particularly pre precarious position to complain uh, to their uh, employers. So uh, this is actually a cartoon uh, that came out in 2007 in The Economist, uh, you know, trying to portray the Canadian policy uh, with regard to migrants. And uh, this uh, is actual data from uh, uh, Immigration Canada, which uh, I believe expresses a tremendous turning point in, in Canadian society as of 2006. I don't know if this is a coincidence or not, but with the conservative government, uh, the, the Harper administration, uh, 
uh, there has been a turning point between the number of new immigrants that come into the country and the number of guest work, temporary uh, workers, all right? Uh, so now it used to be the case that uh, the majority of the people that came to Canada came as immigrants. Presumably, that uh, legal fact alone would at least set the conditions for them to have equal rights to the rest of the labor force. Well, now that is changing in the past several years and at a fairly fast pace. You know, the, the largest influx of uh, workers is uh, temporary workers. So this could actually change the character of Canada and the way it sees itself as a country of immigrants. Now we're getting uh, this sort of non-citizenship uh, status in the labor force. Uh, just to give you a, a hint of uh, what I've been doing in, in British Columbia, uh, to, to finish, I'll say that there are two main components of the labor force here. One is Mexicans, and I think by now they make up about half of the total workforce in the horticultural industry. The other half is made up uh, by immigrants from uh, northern India. Uh, they're Punjabi speakers, mostly women. Uh, their average age is about 45 years. And we actually interviewed uh, some women that were in their early 70s as well. Um, now, what our main conclusion uh, for the BC uh, research, and this was research that I conducted with uh, my colleague, uh, Carrie Privish, who's at the University of Guelph, uh, we basically confirmed that British Columbia fits you know, the type of labor that migrants do around the world which has been labeled in the literature as the three Ds. And the three Ds uh, are basically dirty, difficult, dangerous. And unfortunately, we have to add a fourth D, which is devalued because you know, work is low paid. And these workers have fewer rights than uh, you know, Canadian citizens. So, conclusions. Um, I guess the subtitle here uh, is a little bit provocative. I'm raising the question. Would the best thing would be to move toward a North American Union more or less parallel to the European Union? And what am I uh, implying here? Well, uh, as you probably know, uh, in the European U Union, one of the features of that economic community is that uh, uh, not just commodities and capital can flow freely, but also labor. You know, people, citizens of the European Union can go wherever they find a better work to do. Uh, that seems like a perhaps fairly distant uh, prospect, might be doable, but with the current divisions in, in U.S. society, it doesn't seem to be anywhere uh, near or midterm. So uh, manufacturing uh, jobs are unlikely to return to the United States, uh, uh, at least to the level that uh, used to be associated with uh, the Fordist uh, stage of uh, capital accumulation. Um, so perhaps the best thing uh, for policymakers and human rights uh, activists uh, concerned with uh, human and labor rights is to pursue that, uh, you know, the, uh, policies that ensure equal conditions for all workers, regardless of whether they're domestic or international. Uh, and for, for Mexico, for Mexican uh, political uh, activists, uh, I'm not sure about political or policy makers there. I mean, they've uh, made their bets on neoliberalism, and it was clearly a losing bet. Uh, but the thing in Mexico would be to promote development, including food self-sufficiency, uh, so as to reduce press pressures for migration. Now, what are the social movements in Mexico demanding? Well, uh, it has at least uh, these three components. Food self-sufficiency, and at the center of this is, of course, regaining the possibility for Mexico to be self-sufficient in corn. And, you know, there's been a, a very important movement here and I'll say it in Spanish, sin maíz no hay país, or without corn, there's no country. And that's because of the significance of corn. Uh, 
the cultural significance. Uh, then, of course, there's a the concern of the preservation of plant biodiversity. Mexico has the greatest uh, biodiversity on corn. And now uh, Monsanto is pushing very heavily to uh, make uh, Mexico fair game for transgenic corn. Uh, and, you know, a general reconstruction of the countryside. So I'll leave it at that.